Hello, everybody. Uh, so welcome to Getting Started with Deep Learning Using Keras and NumPy to Detect Voice Disorders uh, by Sebastian and Deborah Hannes. Uh, regarding the Q&A, there will be a short one uh, near the end of the uh, session, provided we have time. Uh, so without further ado. Hi, my name is Deborah, and today we're going to talk to you about our journey and getting started with deep learning using Keras and NumPy to detect voice disorders. I'm Deborah, And I'm Sebastian. To start off, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I did my undergraduate at MIT where I studied um, neuroscience, or brain and cognitive sciences, which is a mix of neuroscience and psychology, uh, and computer science. And I also did my master's in reinforcement learning. I spent a year as a Fulbright Scholar learning how education translates into job creation, particularly in uh, the technology sector. I spent some time working as an early software engineer at a startup in San Francisco. And then I decided to quit life and start a PhD. <laughs> Just kidding. I had an amazing time at Harvard and got to work on a lot of really cool machine learning projects and meet a lot of awesome people like Sebastian. Um, and while I was there, I also um, did some projects with Google Brain. And then um, I started a software company called Sparrow, which provides software that makes it simple for companies to provide their employees with extended leave, like uh, family leave and medical leave. Hi, I'm Sebastian. I started programming when I founded a robotics club with my other sister, Patricia, in Nebraska. At the time, there the only few robot clubs there were were exclusively boys, so our robotics club uh, was all genders, all races inclusive. I did an internship at Sycamore Education, which is a company that develops software for under-resourced schools. I got to do an internship at the University of Nebraska in Omaha in their cybersecurity department where I combined machine learning with cybersecurity to detect attacks over Bluetooth. And finally, I did a research internship at MIT's CSAIL, where I did the uh, project that we'll be using as an example in this talk. So to give you an overview of what's coming, we'll start, about, start with looking at our data, and then Deborah will talk about deep learning and selecting a neural network appropriate to your problem. Then we'll bring that back to our example. And then we'll talk about some common issues that I had that many people will likely have when starting with deep learning. So our goal is to detect whether or not a patient has vocal hyperfunction just from the vibrations of their throat. So vocal hyperfunction is when you consistently overwork your voice and it becomes damaged, you can get vocal nodes and whatnot. And then the accelerometer is, as I said, just resting on the neck. So we don't have recordings of all of the patient's conversations for weeks, just the vibrations. So here's an example of what our data might look like. Uh, we have a period of silence leading up to the utterance. The utterance is a period of continuous speaking with no more than half a second of silence. Uh, we have time on the x-axis, amplitude on the y. Under that, we have our breath group vector, which is what we use to indicate whether or not the patient was speaking. So our squiggly line is going to be our utterance. We want to uh, take out the utterance and leave behind all the long periods of silence. So we pad our breath group vector, diff it, so we make each element equal to the next one minus itself, and then all the ones mark the beginning, all the negative ones mark the end, and then we multiply by the length of the frames that the breath group vector has to get the beginning and endings of our utterances. So then we extract all of those out. So that's an example of what you might have to do when preparing your data before doing any deep learning on it. So now I'll pass it over to Deborah to talk about deep learning. So Sebastian just told you about everything he had to do to prepare the data to get it ready to 
for the deep learning that he did. Um, and so now I'll tell you a little bit more about some of the, some of the landscape in getting started with deep learning. First of all, I would like to congratulate all of you for choosing to get started with Python because, and because this is an amazing place to start if you want to get started with deep learning because there are a lot of great tools that, to, that you can use that are Python-based. Um, so often people will use something like scikit-learn for a lot of their data processing um, because there are, they have a lot of nice libraries for that or a, a lot of nice built-in tools. Um, and then Keras is a Python wrapper that wraps around um, a, a lot of the other tools like Theano, PyTorch, and TensorFlow. And recently, um, TensorFlow has, uh, has had the Keras interface built into it as well. Um, but you, you can use Keras over Theano, PyTorch, or TensorFlow. And the Keras makes everything nice and simple, so it can just be a few lines of code. And uh, the everything, and, but if you want to do something more complicated, you'll probably need to um, use something like Theano, PyTorch, or TensorFlow. So to start off with, let's look at this picture of neurons. It's a really nice picture, right? There's a lot going on here. Like there are a lot of there are a lot of neuronal connections. There. Some of them are stronger than others. Um, there are all these electrical impulses going through them. And this is probably just like one very, 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 very small section of your brain. Um, so, and if, you were to, and if you were to look at a neuroscience textbook, it would model it as something like this. So it still is kind of complicated, but it's, it's not too bad. It's like you have this cell body and has some dendrites which attach to something else. They accept the electrical impulses, and the electrical impulses travel down the axon, which is in insulated by myelin, and end up down at the axon terminal, which then rests on another soma. So there are all these electrical impulses going through this. And if there, if there are a lot of electrical impulses that go through it, it will get thicker and there will be a stronger connection. And if there are fewer, there will be less. So. Sometime, a long time ago, maybe 40 or 50 years, some dude looked at this and he's like, I bet I can do that with some math. And he came up with this thing, which is a perceptron, and it's like a very, very simplified version of a neuron. Which you can see, there, there are some sort of basic similarities, in that like, there are some inputs, sort of like the electrical impulses, um, except these aren't electrical impulses, these are numbers like zeros and ones. So if you're looking at something like an image as input, chances are it's going to be, if it's a 100 by 100 image, it'll probably be 100 by 100 matrix going into the, going into the inputs. And then you can decide how important these are using the weights, how important each input is. And then there's a function that does something to it. And something, the something varies widely. Um, based on the architecture. But here it's just a sigmoid function, so you take those inputs, you put it into a function, and something else comes out. Um, so this isn't going to play AlphaGo for us. Um, it's pretty simple. So if we, but we've seen all these things in the news recently of you know, deep learning being used to play video games, being used to uh, make videos, all sorts of things. So how do we do that? The answer here is uh, we stack more layers. So often, um, what we just described was a fairly simple neural network. And as you add more and more layers, you can sort of keep um, adding more and more things that the network can do. So we'll go a little, we'll make this a little bit more complicated in that now we have a feed-forward neural network. So you can see the yellow circles are um, the, where the inputs go in, the orange are where the outputs go out, and then the green are the hidden layers. So we can see what's going on uh, with the inputs, and we can see what's going on with the outputs, but we can't see what's going on in the hidden layers. And usually, if you have more than one hidden layer, then it becomes a deep neural network. Um, partially because everyone wants their network to be deep. Um, <laughs> So here we have, so this is a, an animation of what this looks like. So you can feed a neural network some uh, pictures like cats, uh, like pictures of cats and dogs. If these are, chances are what is going in though is actually numbers, maybe RGB values, whether or not a certain feature is present. Um, 
And that's what the neural network is learning off of. And it will see lots and lots of training examples. And then it will learn some similarities um, if you label these training examples. So uh, maybe it will learn that cats tend to have pointier ears than dogs, or they have longer whiskers than dogs, or they're just cuter than dogs. Um, but in any case, we get some output, and then it's able to identify with some level of accuracy that this is a cat or this is a dog. So at this point, we have, um, we've gone through some of the basics of how a neural network is built. But like we said, you know, these, uh, they still do some fairly simple, what we just saw still does some fairly simple things. You know, it's like a cat detector, honestly, which, I mean, pe people are much more complicated than being just cat detectors. Um, so I'll give you in some sort of like very broad strokes what some of the architectures are and um, tell you a little bit about what they do and try to point you to some resources for some of the more complicated architectures because there are like hundreds of these coming out every year. Um, so one is a convolutional neural network and this is kind of cool um, because what it does is it actually takes in a lot of information and results in less information, which actually is something that to, on some level people do as well. So like if I'm looking around this room, like technically if a photon of light goes and bounces off of anything in the room and then hits my retina, I've seen it. But I'm definitely not aware of everything going on in this room. Um, and chances are when you guys walk into a big room, you aren't either. Um, so um, similarly, what a convolutional neural network does is it takes a lot of information and it pools that information down usually into an average of that and then it makes its detection off of that. And this kind of uh, neural network is often used for uh, classification or detection. So there's a good chance that that last neural network we saw that was cats versus dogs was probably a convolutional neural network. Um, another cool architecture is the recurrent neural network. And usually these neural networks, they're, they're not actually very smart on their own. They only do exactly what they're told, and they only know what's going on at any given time step. So you can think, if you think of this as like sort of a time series and you show something in image, it only sees that image, it only sees that the, those numbers that you put into it at that moment. As soon as you show it another example, it's automatically forgotten the last example. But the nice thing about it, recurrent neural networks is it introduces the first, uh, a very, very simplified idea of memory in that what it does is it has a feedback loop. So not only does it know what happened on this time step, it also knows what, happens on, what happened on the last time step because of that feedback loop. Um, so then a kind of recurrent neural network is um, the LSTM. And what this does is it, it has that feedback loop, but it's a little bit more complicated than that, and it's, it introduces the notion of state. So you can define not only how it mem remembers the last time step, but you can define uh, it so that it might you can define it so that it might remember several time steps back, or maybe it pays certain uh, it remembers some features longer than others, and these are all things that you just tune with variables. You know, like in this case, c x things like this. Um, so this is all, these are all things that you define as mathematical equations. And this was actually the architecture that Sebastian chose to use um, for his project. And now I will pass it off to him. All right, so we have all of our utterances from before. We feed them into this magical black box and then it's supposed to spit out a classification as either somebody who does have vocal trauma or just a typical member of the population. But first, I'll give some, uh, some of the big libraries that I used. NumPy is a very common library for handling numerical data of any sort. And as Deborah said, even if what you're training on isn't numbers, they'll be made into numbers before you feed them in. And so, it's great for manipulating any arrays of numbers, and there are a few links to tutorials that you can look at afterwards to get started with NumPy. Then Keras, again, as Deborah said earlier, is a really easy to use high-level wrapper over the other things. We'll see uh, soon how just in a few lines of code, 
you can make a neural network that works really well. And again, here are a couple of links. Okay, so here's an example of some code. Uh, before, uh, above this, you want to separate out the training data and the testing data, because if you test on the same data you train on, it will be like if you kept letting a student retake the same exam, and they would just memorize the answers rather than learning the material itself. And so then we can get an accurate evaluation of what kind of generalities our model is actually learning. And then we need to pad all of the data to the same length or truncate it, uh, just because that's what we need to do to feed it into the neural network. Uh, then we define our model. We define various parameters just to get it started. And then that one line, add LSTM with 100 layers, that's just, that's it. It's that easy to use an LSTM. Then we define our activation function, wrap it all together, and fit a, it to our data, evaluate it, and we have an answer. But that's not the end, as we'll see later. So let's talk about some common issues. Neural networks require a lot of data, usually, to get good results. And so there are a lot of issues that come with handling a lot of data. You probably won't be able to hold all of it in memory at once. And if you are used to using something like Pickle, you'll have problems when using large data sets. You might run it on some server somewhere else because your machine may not be powerful enough. So there are issues with that. And then Deborah will talk about analyzing your errors. So. We have a whole lot of data, but not a lot of RAM. And so what we do instead is just take a little bit of data at a time and train on it and do it in small batches. So then, pickle. It works great most of the time for most little things. You just dump Python binary data to a file, pull it back, everything works like magic and it's great. Until you work with large data sets and then stuff breaks and you have no idea why and uh, everything is on fire. So it instead- It shows up as so many end of file errors and corrupted files. <laughs> so uh, instead you can use something like joblib or h5py. I used h5py which stores the data in an HDF5 format, so it's hierarchically stored and you can just save or load in little pieces at a time so that we can do things like run our mini batches like earlier. So now you might start this on your laptop and then uh, connect through SSH to a remote server and then close your laptop and then it'll kill your SSH session and kill your program too. And we don't want our program to get killed until it's done running. So instead, we can use Tmux or Screen to easily manage our sessions. I personally use Tmux. Uh, we have a little screenshot tutorial demo with Screen. So you take out your laptop, connect, open up Screen, run your program that runs forever, Detach, close your laptop, take it off your desk, otherwise it would be a desktop, take it to the coffee shop, open it back up, <laughs> reconnect, and it's still running. And eventually it'll finish, hopefully. We can only hope. So now I'll pass it back to Deborah to talk about analyzing your errors. So Sebastian has talked about a lot of things that go into getting your deep learning algorithm to run. And there are a lot of things that go into it. And while we managed to get through it in about 20 minutes, um, it takes a lot longer than that. There are, you know, like there's all this pre-processing the data. As you can tell in those last three common issues he went through, um, any one of those could keep you hung up for a while. So I think very often people will go, they'll go, they'll write their few lines of Keras, they'll um, get a result and they'll be like, yes, 
I found, you know, I finally have an answer. It has 90% accuracy. I'm done. But the answer, but actually at that point, you're not done. Um, if you do that, you're doing something a little bit like this. <laughs> Um, in that you're putting, you're putting a lot of data into your algorithm, and you're getting some results out, but you don't actually know uh, what's going on in all of those hidden layers. And you don't know exactly what it's learning. And so even, though you have a really, even if you have a really high accuracy, you should always take a moment to say, you know, even if you have 95% accuracy, that means your algorithm got 5% wrong. And it's worth looking at what that, how, what, um, was going on with that 5%. Um, so sort of a textbook example of this um, is uh, Joy Bielamwini's story. Um, so she is a graduate student at the MIT Media Lab, and she does a lot of work with facial detection algorithms. And so there are all these, you know, she's, when she started this maybe five years ago, there were all of these um, out-of-the-box facial detection algorithms that for the most part, large companies had built. Um, but they would never recognize her face. And it turns out that what actually happened is if you think about what data you use to train a facial detection algorithm, you use the information, you use probably pictures that you find on the internet, because then you, you can never snap enough pictures to train it, at which point you end up, um, we have probably like a lot of pictures of actors who are mostly white or politicians who are mostly white, or ads who are mostly targeting white people and are mostly white. Um, so the end result is, well, everyone thought that they were building these facial detection algorithms with 97% accuracy. Actually, what they had built was something that just recognizes something light oval with something that looks sort of like eyes, nose, and a mouth. So, um, Joy found that you know, she couldn't test her algorithms because it didn't recognize her face. Um, so first she would try to get friends to try to test her algorithms with her, but I mean your friends aren't there all the time, you need to spend a lot of time debugging. So she's like, okay, I'll try this mask, which looks absolutely nothing like a face. Um, and it recognized that instead. <laughs> um, just showing sort of like just, just how ridiculous this is and how it can be really difficult to and your algorithm isn't always doing what you think it is. Um, so it's just sort of um, one first thing that you can do here to get started is you can take a look at something like a confusion matrix. And it's possible you have not seen this in introductory to statistics. Um, but what it does is this is built specifically for a two-case classification task. But you can say, like in the case of Sebastian, he's predicting um, does someone have vocal trauma or not? And so if he predicts that they have vocal trauma, and they actually do, that's a true positive. If, he sa if the algorithm says that they don't have vocal trauma and they don't, that's a true negative. If the algorithm says that, um, if says that they have vocal trauma, but they don't, um, then that is a uh, false positive. And then vice versa, if it turns out they actually have vocal trauma, but the algorithm says they don't, then that's a false negative. Um, so what you can do, so it's really important to look at these errors. Like it's maybe you have all false positives, at which point it's very easy to get all false positives. Um, you, in some cases, maybe you just predict uh, everything is positive. So your algorithm isn't actually doing anything. Um, so it's worth looking at how looking at the algorithm, understanding what your errors are, how, why your algorithm is making them, and potentially even thinking about what fairness means in your algorithm. Um, like one definition of fairness is making sure that different categories have the same number of errors. Um, so it's worth thinking about what that means in your case, but in any case, a first step is just making sure that you see what kind of errors you have. And as it turns out, this story actually has a happy ending. Um, Joy published her research um, uh, comparing all of these different facial detection algorithms through Microsoft, Amazon, et cetera. And she found that, um, as you would expect, they have a very high accuracy for particularly light-skinned males. The worst, I think, was uh, dark-skinned women. Uh, and, but she published this research and 
Um, most of the companies went and they went out and they got more training data to make, the, to make their algorithms more accurate. Um, so, you, yeah, yeah, super exciting, right? <laughs> um, so, in any case, um, make sure that you look at your errors. Um, otherwise, you're just sort of stirring data around and you don't actually know what it's doing. I'd like to give a special thanks to Professor Marzia Gesemi for letting me work with her on this project and Professor Peter Solovich for letting me work in his lab. Here are a whole bunch of links to things to help you get started in deep learning. What I found was that there were some times where it really helped to have a real person help me through my problem rather than just trying to find tutorials that I don't know which ones apply to me. Uh, so if you'd like to reach out to either of us on Twitter for anything, those are both of our Twitter handles. So. Uh, Thank you. That's it. All right. So we seem to have a bit of time. So if anybody has any questions, the mic is right over there. Uh, just head on towards it. Yeah, I saw your code. Um, so you, I didn't see a cross validation there. Maybe I missed it. So is it is it just uh, time consuming? Too time consuming to uh, do a cross validation on LSTM, or you just decided to simplify the code? For the example, yes, that was very ah, okay. simplified. But yeah, you did it right. I mean, the cross validation. Yeah, yeah, okay, yes. Sure. Cool. There was a cross validation. We just yeah. didn't show it here. <laughs> Makes sense. Thanks. Yeah. So, given that you were working with the medical data, were you under IRB? And did you have any specific any issues surrounding data acquisition and disposal when you were done? Or yeah, anything like that? Thankfully, since I was working with Marzi and her team on this project, I didn't have to worry about the uh, acquiring the data or handling it afterwards, but I did have to take some tests and sign some things and all that to work on this. Yeah, so, so he had to get uh, the HIPAA certification and the general project was under IRB. Okay. Thank you. Hi. Uh, have you tried uh, using Spark actually? Uh, regards to those issues that you had with uh, memory and disk usage? Uh, I don't know if I heard the whole question, but no, I haven't used Spark for this. Okay. Uh, okay. Because it, uh, it uses clusters, actually, so that, that could help uh, resolve some of your issues. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was using MIT servers that they okay. gave to me. For the voice data itself, uh, in addition to uh, separating out when this, the parts where they're talking, did you have to do any other kind of processing or filtering of the data, or were you able to just feed that into the network? I, uh, after separating it out, I'm making sure each utterance was labeled. Uh, that was all I did. I, I could have done other things like uh, maybe trained on chunks of utterances at a time rather than just one utterance at a time, but there, there are all sorts of things I could have done. But yes, I just did it simple way. Um, hi, thanks for your talk. It's very um, impressive. I have more, two more general questions about deep learning applications. So one is that besides those cognitive um, applications such as image recognition or speech recognition, are you aware of any other successful application of deep learning in um, like time series uh, forecasting or any general planning procedure rather than those cognitive areas? Yes, yeah, yeah there is research using deep learning for, um, like you said, time series forecasting, um, for interpolating some of that data, and um, what was the other thing you mentioned? 
um, like general planning, any type of planning, strategic planning, tactical planning, more like traditional um, operational related? Yeah, yeah, tasks? there are. Um, so for in terms of planning, I've seen a lot of like deep, deep reinforcement learning. But at that point, like the reinforcement is actually doing a lot of the optimization, whereas the deep learning is sort of like a lookup table to figure out where you're going. Um, but um, I've seen it, yeah, I'd say I've seen a little bit less with planning, but I haven't, I haven't searched that specifically, and I would expect that there is research there. It seems like people are trying to use deep learning for everything at the moment, even things it doesn't actually, it isn't actually a good application for. Yeah, that's actually my concern. But um, another thing real quick about image recognition. So how good is the, um, the OCR or image recognition out there now regarding detecting very similar items such as um, like cartons, boxes, um, they have a just very similar appearances, but then, um, yeah, um, I actually haven't. I actually haven't looked at the recent literature there. Um, I think that uh, the numbers that I would be citing would be like what I looked at in my masters, which at this point is like five years old. Um, so I would I would recommend Google Scholar for that. Okay, thanks very much. Yeah. Thanks a bunch for the talk. Um, Deborah, I think this follows up on something you just said in response to that question, which was people trying to use deep learning for all sorts of stuff. Um, was your thought in using the neural net here that you wanted to use a neural net for the sake of learning about neural nets, or was it you had a problem and you knew neural nets would be the best way to solve it? And if that's the case, which I presume it is, uh, what are some mental filters that you work through once you have a problem to try to get to the exact model type that you want to end up using to solve that problem? That's a difficult question, actually. Um, so, so one thing that I sh that I sh resource that we shared here was the neural network zoo, um, which is sort of nice in that it's basically it's essentially a ch cheat sheet of a lot of the sort of like main level architectures and some of what they're used for. Um, so something like th something like that is really helpful. Um, but I think that at this point, a lot of it. There aren't a lot of really good summaries. Um, there's also like Ian Goodfellow's deep learning book, which is which is pretty good. I'd say particularly for what you're talking about, like the middle section of that book would be what you were looking at. But a lot of it is, um, you know, like go actually going to the papers and saying what has someone else used for this. Um, I think that right now there are there are sort of so many architectures that sometimes it's hard to keep track of what everything that you could be using. Um, so I would recommend probably if you're starting a new project to start with something like the neural network zoo or some Google searches of what other t what sorts of uh, architectures other people are using for that, and then um, sort of expanding out from there. But I'd say this: what is right for what on some level is still an open research area. Thank you both. Basic question: Are you making your slides available online? Uh, yes, um, we will tweet them out afterwards. We've seen over the course of the last few years, technology greatly change how deep learning models are made with GPUs greatly speeding up the training time. Do you know how NVMEs might change how we do things? How, I'm sorry, can you repeat the last part of it? Yeah, NVMe, the solid state hard drives, oh. they have about six times the read speed of SSDs. They're like memory fast. Yeah. Um, I'm not familiar with them, so I'm not sure I can comment um, intelligently to that. OK, thank you. Uh, so a lot of vocal disorders kind of manifest themselves in uh, breaks in the voice where, like, for someone like me who is a person with vocal uh, issues, uh, what happens is you start speaking, and then there will be various breaks because your vocal cords physically can't vibrate properly. And so I'm curious how data scrubbing, where you remove those breaks and those pauses, um, is that over sanitizing uh, the way that the voice is actually working and making you miss a lot of stuff, potentially? That's a great point. I was not, uh, I didn't do a, much research into vocal disorders when doing this project. As long as it's less than half a second pause, it should have caught it, uh, or a second depending on where the frames cut off. Uh, but yes, also, it may have learned that shorter lengths uh, consistently were associated with voice disorders. I, I don't know. Uh, but yeah, that's my only thoughts. 
So thank you. Thank you. I love how many I love how many questions everybody had. Um, anyways, thank you very much, right. uh, Sebastian. Oh, I'm so sorry. Question. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I missed this, but was there any metrics on performance of this model? Uh, they weren't in the slides, but I got close to 90% accuracy. But again, that was before thorough analysis of my results, like uh, what Deborah talked about. So. Yeah, this this was like a this was sort of like a first, I'd say, few steps through the pro through the project. There are definitely still a lot of ways to improve it. Yes. Okay, so it's not necessarily being used actively to sort of treat voice disorders or anything like that or identify them. Or this model, no. <laughs> okay, thank you. I, there might be similar ones, but not this one. Again, I'm really sorry about that. <laughs> All right, well, thank you very much, and thank you. Yep. Thank you.